Hi guys, welcome to MedSurge Mentor. Today we will discuss about the topic myocardial infarction. First of all, let's see what's the meaning of myocardial infarction. Myo means muscle, cardial refers to the heart, and infarction means death of tissue due to lack of blood supply. Now let's see the definition of myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is a condition that occurs as a result of occlusion of the coronary artery causing irreversible cell injury and necrosis. Etiology of myocardial infarction Imbalance in oxygen demand and supply resulting from a complete occlusion of one or more coronary artery by rupture of atherosclerotic plaque, thrombus formation, and coronary artery spasm. Risk factors of MI Hypertension, diabetes mellitus, high cholesterol, lack of exercise, obesity, and the other risk factors are poor diet, excessive alcohol intake, smoking, stress and drugs like cocaine. Factors affecting plaque rupture. There are two factors. First one is internal factors and the other one is external factors. Now let's see the internal factors contributing to the plaque rupture. The first factor is plaque characteristics. Those are size of the plaque, consistency of the lipid core and thickness of the fibrous cap and the second factor is vulnerability of the plaque a plaque is considered as vulnerable if it has large lipid core thin fibrous cap and irregular shape with fissures on the core external factors contributing to the plaque rupture Strenuous physical activity, emotional stress, and increased sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Now let's see the pathophysiology of myocardial infarction. Due to the etiological factors, there is damage to the endothelial layer of the blood vessels, that is the coronary arteries. Due to this, there is deposition of lipids into the intimal layer of the blood vessels. As a result of this, the inflammatory process gets activated and the T lymphocytes and monocytes infiltrate into the area, which in turn result in the formation of the fibrous cap over the fatty core, which is commonly known as plaque or atheroma. At the next stage, the plaques protrude into the lumen of the vessels, causing narrowing and obstruction of the blood vessels. Then there can be either a thin or thick fibrous cap. If the fibrous cap is thick, it can resist the stress of the blood flow. Or if it's thin or vulnerable, it can cause rupture of the cap and bleeding into the plaque. And at the very next stage, it can cause formation of the thrombus, which can in turn obstruct the coronary blood flow, which is leading to myocardial ischemia, leading to infarction. Now let's move on to the clinical features of myocardial infarction. The first and prominent feature of myocardial infarction is angina, which is often expressed as pressure, tightness, pain, squeezing or aching sensation in your chest or arms, and it can be spread to your neck, jaw, back, and stomach. Other clinical features of myocardial infarction are shortness of breath, diaphoresis, nausea, indigestion, heartburn or abdominal pain, fatigue, dizziness, fast heart rate, and anxiety. Now let's discuss the classification of myocardial infarction. 
The first classification is based on the layers involved and it's categorized into two. The first one is Q wave or transmural myocardial infarction. It means there's extensive damage to all layers of the myocardium. And the second one is the non Q wave myocardial infarction, which means only the sub endocardial layer is affected. Now let's see the classification based on the vessels occluded. Those are anterior wall MI, inferior wall MI, posterior wall MI, lateral wall myocardial infarction, and right ventricular MI. In anterior wall myocardial infarction, there's occlusion to left anterior descending coronary artery, and it supplies to left ventricle and anterior to third of interventricular septum. And the ECG changes can be seen in anterior leads, which are V3, V4, and septal V1 and V2. Next type is inferior wall myocardial infarction. It occurs due to the occlusion of right coronary artery and it can be seen in around 80 to 90 percentage of patients. It may manifest as arrhythmias and the ECG changes can be evident in lead 2, lead 3 and AVF. In lateral wall myocardial infarction, there's occlusion to the coronary artery supplying lateral wall of left ventricle. And ECG changes can be seen in leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6. And the blood vessels occluded can be circumflex branch of left anterior descending artery, diagonal branch of left anterior descending artery, and terminal branch of right coronary artery. Next one is right ventricular myocardial infarction. It occurs due to the occlusion of right coronary artery proximal to the marginal branch. An inferior wall MI can be complicated with right ventricular MI. Next one is the classification of MI based on the ST elevation. This is purely based on the ECG changes, that is the change in the ST segment of the ECG. It is mainly divided into two, and the first one is called ST elevation MI. And in this, there's a complete occlusion of the epicardial vessel, which is resulting in the injury and infarct to the myocardium. And as the name suggests, there's ST elevation above the baseline. And the second category is called non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And in this, there's a partial occlusion to the coronary artery which is resulting in less heart damage and there's no significant ST elevation in the ECG. Now let's discuss about the silent myocardial infarction. It occurs in 20 to 64 percentage of all infarctions. It is commonly seen in elderly, patients with diabetes mellitus and patients after heart transplantation. The major causes of silent attack in diabetic patients are differences in the pain threshold, autonomic neuropathy, and psychological factors. ECG changes based on arteries and walls. Left anterior descending artery, V1 to V6, circumflex, lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6, right coronary artery, lead 2, 3, and AVF, anterior wall, V3, V4, septal wall, V1 and V2, lateral wall, lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6, and posterior wall, ST depression in V1 to V4. Common ECG changes for myocardial infarction, ST segment elevation, T-wave inversion, pathologic Q-wave, ST depression. Now, let's discuss about the second diagnostic method that is serum cardiac markers. So, these are biomarkers which are basically enzymes that is released to the bloodstream following myocardial damage. So, these are 
CK, CKMB, troponin I and troponin T, myoglobin. First one is CK, that is creatinine kinase. It is released to the bloodstream within 3 to 4 hours of MI and it will stay in the blood for 3 to 4 days. The second one is CKMB. It is released to the bloodstream within 4 to 6 hours of MI and it will stay for 6 to 10 days. The third one is troponin I and troponin T. This is cardiospecific and it is released within 3 to 4 hours of injury and it will stay in the blood for 10 days. And the last one is myoglobin. It is released within 30 minutes to 1 hour of MI and the disadvantage is that it is not specific to myocardium. Next is hemodynamic monitoring. It provides a precise and current data on the filling and output status of the heart. It includes central venous pressure, cardiac output, pulmonary artery and pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, intra-arterial pressure and heart rate. Cardiac imaging techniques are contrast echocardiogram, contrast enhanced MRI, 3D echo, perfusion studies, wall motion score index. Wall motion score index is divided into four, normokinesia, hypokinesia, akinesia, and dyskinesia. Next is complications of myocardial infarction. These are infarct expansion, left ventricular aneurysm, left ventricular failure, hemodynamic alterations, late pericarditis, cardiogenic shock, and recurrent MI. Mechanical complications of myocardial infarction are ventricular septal rupture, ventricular wall rupture, mitral regurgitation, arrhythmia, and ventricular aneurysm. Now let's move on to the immediate treatment for myocardial infarction. These are abbreviated to MONA, which is M for morphine, O for oxygen, N nitroglycerin, and A for aspirin. The management of MI includes thrombolytic therapy, percutaneous coronary interventions, and pharmacological management. In thrombolytic therapy, there are two kinds of fibrinolytic agents that can be used. The first one is fibrin selective. The second is non-fibrin selective agents. The first category is fibrin selective agents. The mechanism is by activation of fibrin bound plasminogen. They can cause high velocity of clot lysis. The example of fibrin selective agent is tissue plasminogen activators or TPA. The second category is non-selective agents. This acts by systemic plasminogenolysis which has got a prolonged systemic lytic stage and the examples are streptokinase and urokinase. Indications of thrombolytic therapy. It should be within six hours of onset of chest pain. And the second one is more than 0.1 millivolt of ST elevation in two or more consecutive leads. Contraindications of thrombolytic therapy. It is divided into two, that is absolute contraindications and relative contraindications. So the first one is absolute one. So that is hemorrhagic stroke, intracranial tumor, active internal bleed, and aortic aneurysms. The relative contraindications are uncontrolled hypertension, that is more than 180 over 100, intracranial pathology, anticoagulant usage, bleeding disorders, 
recent trauma and active peptic ulcer. Now let's discuss about structure kinase in Shan. It's an enzymatic protein product of hemolytic structure cocci and when it combines with the plasminogen it forms a proteolytic enzyme called plasmin and dissolves the thrombi. Tissue plasminogen activators are a protein produced by the vascular endothelial cells which exhibit high affinity to fibrin bound plasminogen and the maximum dosage is 100 mg. Retiplase is the newer kind of tissue plasminogen activators and it favors selective clot lysis and it is given in two doses of 10 mega units IV bolus 30 minutes apart. The drugs used in the pain management in myocardial infarction are nitroglycerin and morphine. The major percutaneous coronary interventions used in treating myocardial infarction are angioplasty and stenting, atherectomy and thrombus aspiration. Angioplasty. It is done to replenish the blood supply through a blocked coronary artery. It is done percutaneously. It either uses femoral or radial artery to introduce a sheet transducer. Then a guiding catheter is placed at the mouth of the coronary artery and then the iodine-based dye is injected. Based on the X-ray studies, perfusion analysis can be done. By this, the area of stenosis can be identified and finally, the balloon is inflated at the stenosed area and the stent is placed to avoid restenosis. Cardiac stents are a tiny expandable metal mesh coil. It helps to prevent the restenosis of the arteries. There are two types of stents. The first one is drug eluting stent and the next one is non-drug eluting stent. The next procedure is called atherectomy. It's a minimally invasive endovascular surgery technique for removing the atherosclerotic plague from the blood vessels. A catheter carrying a rotating shaver is introduced to scrape away the plague from the blood vessels. Next procedure is thrombus aspiration. It means removal of thrombus by using a guiding catheter it uses negative pressure for this procedure. Pharmacological management of myocardial infarction. Drugs commonly used are aspirin, heparin, nitrates, beta blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, calcium antagonist, glycoprotein 2B3A receptor antagonist, warfarin sodium, and morphine. Post-myocardial infarction lifestyle modifications include dietary modifications, antioxidant intake, weight control, smoke cessation, exercise, and continuous treatment. Rehabilitation after myocardial infarction. It is divided into four phases. Phase 1 is inpatient phase and phase 2 is immediate outpatient. Phase 3 intermediate outpatient and phase 4 maintenance outpatient. Some of the common nursing diagnoses for patient with myocardial infarction are acute pain, ineffective tissue perfusion, decreased cardiac output, activity intolerance, fear and anxiety, risk for excess fluid volume, deficient knowledge, and risk for arrhythmia. Thank you. If you find this helpful, please like, share, and subscribe.